All right, welcome to the inaugural episode of Off the Chain, where all sorts of people will tell us their supply chain stories, stories that will hopefully uh, entertain us, enlighten us, and maybe even inspire us. So, uh, my name is Eddie Davila. I'm an instructor of supply chain management at Arizona State University. And today, my guest is Michael Adan. And I've known Michael for a long time. Uh, right, Mike? So, before. Yeah, we, uh, uh, since so we've been five. <laughs> and, that, and that's all I'll say about how long we've known each other. No, you can tell. No, just go ahead. Tell, tell them like how, how we met. So Eddie and I met in kindergarten. Uh, I've known Eddie since uh, we were both five going to kindergarten. He actually lived down the street. And uh, interestingly enough, the only way that Eddie at the time uh, in school could communicate uh, because Eddie was uh, only speaking Spanish was through my mother, who was from Italy. And so she spoke fluent Italian. So uh, Eddie and my mom were able to communicate. And then when I found out that Eddie lived down the block, uh, Eddie and I became fast friends. And uh, it's been that way ever since. So uh, we've colliding. known each other quite a long time. Yeah, so, uh, and, and, so, and somehow we then both end up in supply chain. Yeah, so interestingly enough, our, our paths diverged and now we're almost back again in supply chain. So today, uh, I have a, a bunch of interesting stories to tell you guys uh, about what life in supply chain is like today, uh, as opposed to a month ago. Uh, this is being recorded during the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis in the United States, and that has really wreaked a lot of uh, havoc on the supply chain. So uh, looking forward to talking to you about what the practical implications of this crisis for supply chain really has meant. So why don't you start off telling us uh, what, what was your... What's your accidental trip into the world of supply chain? How'd you get there? Uh, it was, I was forced to go into supply chain. I was actually in my master's program at uh, one of my first jobs at the True Value Company in retail. And uh, my VP who I was in class with said, you know, you would be great as a buyer. So I went into buying and then that ended up shifting me into inventory management, which then shifted me into logistics when I joined Sears Holdings Corporation, and now I am the uh, director of the value chain program for a company called Network Services out of Schaumburg, Illinois. And most of you, uh, most of your audience have probably never heard of uh, Network Services, but uh, I have some props here uh, to kind of show what we do. If you've ever seen um, a bag uh, from Amazon Home Grocery Delivery, that comes from Network Services. If you've ever seen uh, things of this nature, a spork uh, at your local Costco uh, with a company called uh, Club Demo Services. That is also from Network Services. And of course, if you've been in, in a restaurant or uh, a major airport in the United States and you've seen the all coveted toilet paper rolls or the all coveted uh, plastic napkins, uh, all of that comes from network services. We are a conglomerate of about 129 distribution companies across the United States, Mexico, uh, uh, South America, and Europe. And what we do is we do a lot of products in food packaging, uh, like I showed you the Amazon bags, um, food service, uh, cups, holders, uh, containers, and then of course, Jansan, which is a lot of hand sanitizer, uh, cleaning products and personal care products. So that's network services, and right now uh, our business so, so is let's start uh, like a month challenging. Ago. So let's start like yeah, let's start like two, two months ago, three months ago. How did how, what was normal life like at Network and with the companies that you work with? How, what's that relationship like, and what you guys do? Yeah, so normal relationship is uh, many of our corporate customers, for example. Um, uh, Whole Foods uh, Markets is one of our corporate customers, Amazon, um, Baskin Robbins, uh, these type of companies, it was business as usual. They would order their, their cleaning products or they would order their food service products. And it was, it was really routine. It was not really anything uh, out of the ordinary. Enter in COVID-19. Uh, once COVID-19 hit, um, all bets were off. Um, Many of our distributors and many of our corporate customers were all of a sudden it, it very much increased. Uh, things that have increased uh, exponentially. Food packaging and delivery packaging has exploded. Uh, hand hygiene, 
anything to do with hand hygiene, and this is your Purell's of the world, exploded. People were ordering, instead of just getting their normal 50 cases, they were ordering five truckloads. Um, and so what, what has really occurred in the industry is now a term, it used to be called allocation, and now it is called supply pacing. So that's the new term where uh, amounts of goods are being um, stratified based on your past order history and based on what you know your importance as a customer so if I have a um, hundred cases of a product uh, I'm going to supply paste that product to give five cases to each of my customers and if you're a new customer looking for business uh, oh I'm a new customer I'm gonna buy this from you quite often that business is being turned away because we don't even have enough to stock our regular customers so a month ago, product was flowing. Any new customer would raise their hand and say, oh, let, let us do business. We would take that on. Now, it is really much more of who needs the product and who can we give it to. One of our biggest um, uh, verticals that we distribute in is healthcare. So okay. two of the biggest um, healthcare group purchasing organizations, Vizient and Premier, they service, I believe, 90% of the hospitals in the United States. We are one of the major suppliers to both Vizient and Premier. And so our distribution companies are really focused on getting healthcare. So before, a month ago, food packaging was all the rage and, you know, um, paper was all the rage. Do, now, do, you, do you remember the day when you were like, oh, damn, like, the things have shifted. Do you, do, did it happen over time or was it a quick, everybody woke up and said, oh, I, I need toilet paper, I need sanitizer? It was, it was very instant. In, in fact, it was interesting. And what I find interesting about supply chain in this day and age is that supply chain from a corporate standpoint mimics regular consumer behavior. <laughs> so, and, and so here's what I, I refer to. Most consumers now are very much used to Amazon Prime deliveries coming in one day. And that has really created a, a, an anomaly in the supply chain because companies that used to buy pallets at a time, they have now shifted to cartons at a time. The mentality of getting things instant and just in time from the retail model from Amazon has now filtered through the corporate model in wholesaling where people are expecting smaller quantities of goods in a faster amount of time. Well, interestingly enough, when this broke out and the news reports started to come out about consumers hoarding toilet paper and Purell and everything of that nature, it was at the exact same time that companies began to hoard as well. Uh, the buyers started to buy truckloads of toilet paper they started to buy truckloads of Purell and other sanitary products. We could not save ourselves to get any type of disinfecting wipes. Anything that we have from Clorox or from a chemical point of view skyrocketed. I mean, it's almost overnight. And it mimicked the fear or the, the reaction from the consumers. So it's interesting. Yeah, and I was going to say that, like, you know, and, and there are some people that uh, I don't know how, how you want to classify them, but that they were buying all these things a month or two ago. You know, there's a few, you know, sort of people that are ready for the apocalypse at any time. And did you see a couple of companies? And I don't know if you've looked through the data yet. Were there a few companies that you're like, wow, if we look back, I think they saw what was going to happen or they were, they were willing to take a risk or how, however you want to look at that. Yeah, and I will say, uh, um, and I, I guess I could say this, Amazon packaging was one of the very first ones two weeks ago that were aware of what was happening because they saw what was happening in Seattle. Mm -hmm. they, I mean, if you remember when this first broke out, the very first big outbreak was in Washington State. It was in the Seattle area where Amazon is headquartered. Yeah. Their forecasters actually reacted um, and were sending us updated forecasts, up to 30 to 40% increases of forecasts. And they've been increasing their forecasts uh, by region 
um, about twice a week now. So they were actually, they actually recognized what this would mean weeks ago. As soon as the outbreak happened, they were actually right on top of it. So today's, now, the, I was going to say, today's Monday, uh, March 23rd. Where do things stand today in the world of toilet paper and sanitizer and that sort of thing? Well, what you have now is you have um, the supply chain for toilet paper and for hand sanitizer is running into a packaging issue because um, the little bottles and the little caps for the retail side are running out and there's not enough supply of packaging to package the actual Purell, for example. Purell is, uh, you know, basically it's alcohol and gel. Mm -hmm. That's all it really is. And they can make a lot of that at one point, but you got to package it to get it out. If you want a truckload of Purell, that's easy. We can get a tank <laughs> truck into you, Purell all day. It's the retail packaging. So right now, um, as long as the, the supply pacing continues, there really isn't um, shortages, major shortages of that type of product. Where there is shortages right now is any, anything in the medical field. So uh, I serve on a task force uh, that's reporting up to um, Health and Human Services and FEMA, and we're a conglomerate of about 20 companies that are participating on daily calls with the government to determine where we can find supplies of N95 masks, gowns, anything that's in the personal protective equipment, PPE on healthcare, that right now is in really big demand. Um, those are products that are that need to be manufactured because they're, you know, they can be quite pricey. And in order to accommodate that, you're looking at, you know, the system can normally handle a 10 to 20% increase in demand. You have almost 80 to 90 to 100% increase in demand. The system is just, it's just not prepared for that. And so globally, a lot of these products are sourced globally. Well, we're running into the problem now because those countries that make this, namely uh, China, Malaysia, Jordan, and other countries of that nature, they're, they're retaining all of that production capacity because they need it. Ah. Now, now have, you, so, have you ever had, in, you know, if you look back at your, uh, at your career, has there ever been a moment where you have experienced anything else like this sort of calamity and chaos and people sort of losing their, their heads? Yeah. Uh, it, absolutely. I was, uh, I was an inventory buyer for uh, during Hurricane Katrina uh, mm. that happened in the southeast of the United States. The one thing that I can tell you and your viewers is that it's, it's, one needs to be very careful of the knee-jerk reaction and decisions that are made uh, for inventory replenishment. Uh, the, the great story I have is for during Hurricane Katrina, uh, the company that I worked for, we were prepared to send uh, 20 truckloads of generators down to Louisiana uh, for New Orleans and Mississippi and, and for that entire area. And I stood up in a meeting and I, and I said to the team, why would we do that? And they looked at me I have, as if I had three heads. <laughs> I said, the reason why I question it is because there are no homes. There are no homes to power. There is nothing to generate power for. These homes are gone. The appliances that they were using, those are gone. And even the people are gone. They're not there. So, um, you know, it's, it's the knee-jerk reaction. And then on the flip side, it's, it's the inaction, right? Inaction can create uh, a lot of issues as well. I think during this crisis, um, you know, everybody is, is crying out, we need product, but they don't understand the full supply chain that it's not, uh, it's a, you know, it's like a, an aircraft carrier. It turns very slowly. You have to, you have to build up the product. You have to build up the raw materials. You have to make it, and then you have to give it. Now, what we have seen is a lot of companies that are um, supply pacing their N95 masks, and everything is going right now to healthcare, which it it, it should be. There's hoarding going on, but it's not uh, unnecessary. It, it's places like New York and California that have a lot of cases of coronavirus right now are getting the products um, uh, that they need. And so, and have you seen, you've been talking a lot about, you know, purchasing the items and storing them and inventory and those sorts of things. What are we seeing on the transportation side? So 
right now, our the transportation is is holding. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of local deliveries, at least from our distributors. Uh, there hasn't been any issues because most of our distributors are quite local, and we're talking when we say local between zero and 125 miles. So many of that type of product is going to local distribution and then sending out. And many of those trucks are privately owned and those fleets are privately owned. We have not seen any disruption in transportation as of yet relative to getting product from suppliers and manufacturers to localized distribution. So, so far, uh, the transportation system seems to be holding up very well uh, despite, um, you know, despite shelter in order um, edicts that are going on. I do know that the, the, uh, the Department of Transportation has exempted trucking as one of these, you must be, you're, you are an essential business uh, because food products and, and packaging products and janitorial and sanitation products need to continue to move. So trucking really hasn't felt an impact yet. Okay, and, and uh, if you look forward, you know, based on where you're sitting in terms of, um, you know, working with distributors and seeing sort of the retail end and also the manufacturing end, what are you, for those of people that are worried about having enough toilet paper, what do you see in the future uh, for toilet paper? Will there be some, a lot? How's that gonna work out? Well, I think the initial, the, the initial draw of the supply was pretty shocking to everybody, but there has been no disruptions in manufacturing. Uh, there's no disruptions at this point in the supply. My fear is that you're actually going to get a glut. If think of it as a big bubble, so there was this big bubble of demand. Well, that bubble is not going to continue on the timeline. That bubble is eventually going to burst, and then you're going to have a glut of supply. So right now, manufacturers are being very careful because if they overproduce, mm -hmm. um, then you're not going to have, number one, enough space to store the product. You're not going to have the demand to pull the product. Um, but a lot will depend on the, the shelter-in-place orders that exist now in numerous states in the United States. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. But my, my theory is that in a few months, you're going to see a glut of supply. Inventories will be at their highest levels. Um, and then you're going to have that impact where you're going to see a delayed reaction in the supply chain because then manufacturing is going to stop. Manufacturing will stop until the demand catches back up. People have brought in so much, um, the, the, laggard indicate, the lag indicator is going to hit manufacturing, I think, in July, August. And now the, the other thing I was wondering was, and I was thinking of this with restaurants, and, but it would go to, for, for you as well, in terms of um, the materials that you're working with. I'm thinking there's a lot of restaurants out there that were buying food, that were buying you know, meat and bread and all that sort of stuff. And those restaurants have sort of closed down. And so there's this glut of material that's available, these ingredients that are available, but we now need them in grocery stores instead of restaurants. Do you sort of see the same thing in your industry where, wow, we, people used to need toilet paper at all of these facilities, but nobody's really going there anymore. Now that, that demand is for the consumer instead of commercial. And, and how does that impact you guys? Well, interestingly enough, one of our biggest uh, segments is in restauranting as well. Many of our distributors uh, service local restaurants. And so, what we've seen is, is a vast increase in food packaging. So um, I think I held this up before. This is the, the packaged fork, knife, spoon, salt, and napkin. That actually has risen exponentially because many restaurants are shifting to takeout at this point. Yeah. So the food stuffs that they were buying, albeit less, they are still consuming. And now food packaging is uh, becoming uh, much more in demand. And interestingly enough, here is where regulation and local regulation now conflict with emergency management. And I'll give you an example. Um, the bag that we do for Amazon, it's a paper bag because many municipalities have now outlawed the plastic bags. Even though plastic is much easier, cheaper, and faster to make, People are banning styrofoam, which is very fast, quicker, easy, cheaper to make. 
um, as opposed to now going to paper packaging. Some of those regulations, I believe, are going to have to be relaxed because otherwise you're not going to have enough food packaging to deliver to people. So it's interesting during a crisis how sometimes regulations can actually hinder and hurt uh, rather than uh, be of, of, of benefit. The long-term benefit, of course, is there, you know, the, the sustainability of packaging using recyclable products. But in the short term, uh, when you have a crisis like this, um, that's when things get a little bit uh, muddled. And what are, you, are you seeing any of that already? Is, is, you know, people pushing back saying, hey, I don't want this packaging. I want this. Don't you, you know, how are people reacting on the outside? Um, they're grabbing, they're, they're taking any packaging that they could get at this point. They are. Okay. Yeah, okay. absolutely. They, they are, they're taking styrofoam, uh, styrofoam uh, uh, clam, clamshells and, and paper clamshells. They're taking anything that they can get because again, as the shelter in place orders exist, more people will be demanding that. Um, and so the big fear, however, is from a supply chain perspective to answer one of your questions about the food and supplies. Many of the companies that are being affected by shelter in place by not being able to have a, a, uh, a dining room restaurant, those may have, may not survive. Um, you know, you may be looking at a 50% decrease in restaurants, um, over you know the period of time because if uh, for example it wasn't food that they were concentrating but their bar you know they they make a lot of money selling alcohol well if that was their primary revenue stream well that revenue stream is now gone they may not be able to make it just on food service takeout alone so one of the things that we are hearing from our distribution companies in the united states is that there is a real fear that many of these local restaurants are going to go out of business and, and what does that mean? You know, those are a lot of little customers. What does that mean for the companies that you work with? So interestingly enough, um, remember what I said about that bubble in the, in the supply? Yeah. That'll be exacerbated because not only will it be for toilet paper and, and Jansan products, but now you'll have a glut of supply for food packaging. And so now there'll be multiple, um, There'll be multiple industries and multiple packaging and multiple supply type of impacts from these restaurant closings. And often these small restaurants, they're higher margin. They are a higher, higher margin, margin for business who? for who? For our for the distributor. For the because service. they don't right, because they don't buy as much. They don't they, they buy in you know case quantities versus pallet quantities. So you can get two to three to five points more margin. But if that business goes away, um, there's, a, there's a real financial impact that will be on the distributor and also on the manufacturer of these products. So small mom and pop restaurants being impacted by this is going to reverberate in the supply chain in a big way. Do you know people at work that, have, that were around um, in 2008, 2009? Um, did, have you heard anything about what it took for the sort of restaurant economy to come back at that period of time? And is that sort of informing you guys in terms of things you're doing today? This is a little different because back in 2008, 2009, it was much more of a financial impact. The restaurants were open still. They, they yeah. were able to continue to serve. They were able to continue to, to, uh, to service that part of the public that still was solvent. Um, now, everybody is, you know, if you think about it, everybody is insolvent. There's nobody that can, well, I shouldn't say that. There are people who can still go, but there's a, they've cut off those businesses lifeline, which are people coming into their stores. And yeah. so that's, it's a little bit different. I don't think you can compare 2008, 2009 with what's happening today. No. Yeah. And, and I, I see it now because yeah, you're, you're back then, if you were seeing restaurants closed, you were seeing a maybe fast but steady decline and here it's going to be falling off a cliff where the restaurants were there and now they're gone and never to open again yeah it's it, it this was much more dramatic and instant 2008 2009 it was over you know months of financial decline um you know but here you know last friday the governor of illinois which is where we're at said everything is closed 
uh, on Monday. I mean, instant, it's, everything is closed. Now, what will be interesting to see and what we're really watching is how long these closures are going to be um, and how long the public is going to, I'll say, put up with Mm -hmm. um, the closures, because there is a point, I believe, at which um, people are going to get really tired and frustrated and they're going to just go and they're going to just go out anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully in a few weeks, if this, uh, if the, the, the spread of the COVID-19 virus ends up going down, decreasing or leveling off, uh, those restrictions will be lifted and, and businesses can get back to being a little bit normal. If it extends out into the, you know, throughout April into the month of May, um, I, I think you're going to see some real serious supply chain consequences coming up uh, for the industry. And this is all industries. All right, I'm going to give you one more question before we uh, take off here. Um, so we're going to see this massive drop off in the number of restaurants and not just restaurants, businesses in general, just mm -hmm. gone. And will that intense drop in the number of organizations that are buying from your distributors, will we see distributors also going down in the next six to 12 months? That's a very good question. And at this point, we're not exactly sure, but we can say that many of the distribution companies that we deal with in across the United States are very diverse in their, um, in the businesses that they run. Um, you know, often, quite often they have, you know, seven to 10 verticals within which they service, uh, food service packaging, industrial supply, private packaging. So it would really have to be very catastrophic uh, to the economy for that type of thing to happen. Uh, but many of our distributors are all privately held. Uh, they're all family run businesses um, and they've managed through a lot of diversity. Uh, in the past. What I think you will see is you may see uh, a lot more consolidation of uh, businesses um, where, you know, the strength in numbers uh, comes into play. Uh, but it's something that we're definitely going to watch very closely as we proceed down this uh, unknown path. And I lied to you. I'm going to ask you one more question. One more question. No, no um, more questions. You, no, just one. Just one. I'm kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, what do you see, you know, it, with all of the horrible things going on right now, from a business perspective in the industry that you're in, what do you see as the opportunities right now? What are the opportunities that you're telling your distributors about that maybe they're not quite seeing or that they might not believe are gonna happen in the next uh, year or so? Well, this, according to the research and the data analytics that our group performs for our, for our distributors, um, this is a really great time to clean up. Um, there is a lot of inventory that's held that's, um, that doesn't turn as well. And these are products that may be uh, held in small or larger quantities. So we tell, we're telling our members, just be cautious when you stock back up, clean out your inventories now, uh, because one of the biggest things that impacts our distributors is holding on to inventory and lack of turns. So when they're holding on to this inventory for longer periods of time, they're not turning it, that cash is, is held up in all of that product. Now they have a really good opportunity to clear out a lot of product uh, and be very careful about bringing that back in, um, using that past history about what they really need um, will really help them. This uh, may not happen next year. We hope it doesn't happen next year. So when they uh, review their inventory levels next year for this period of time, they have to be very careful to remember a lot of this product was sold out because of, you know, uh, supply pacing, hoarding, uh, whatever you want to call it. And so there's a real opportunity now to convert a lot of that older inventory back into cash and reinvest it into products like, you know, like toilet paper, uh, things that basic items that will sell, uh, all year round and convert that cash, um, you know, into better profitability for the, for themselves. All right, Mike, why don't you tell uh, people how to connect with you on LinkedIn or however it is that you like, and uh, maybe even tell them a little bit about your company so uh, we can get on out. 
Sure, and actually, uh, Network Services is based in Schaumburg, Illinois. My email address is mladon at networkdistribution.com. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, so feel free to uh, link in. The spelling of my last name is L-E-D-O-N-N-E. -N -N -E. And uh, we, I do talk about supply chain a lot. I talk with Ed uh, quite a bit about supply chain. I also uh, guest lecture at a couple of universities uh, in the area relative to supply chain. So uh, supply chain is a very critical part of uh, the American way. And uh, if you ever want to talk about it, please feel free to reach out. And uh, I thank Ed for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about network services and uh, also about supply chain. So thanks, Ed. Thank you. I mean, you, you, you pretty much carried the whole uh, interview there. So you did an excellent job. And I'm sure we'll have you back in a little bit of time to see how things uh, shuffled out. We should. We should review this in about six months to see the reverberations from the COVID-19 crisis and how it's impacted uh, distribution. And how many and things I, you got right and how many things you got wrong. I'm hoping I'm more right than wrong. <laughs> we we do let's, too. Let's, let's see. All, All right, right, Ed. So I, see you later. All right, talk to you, bye.